Okay, so thank you everyone for being so faithful and uh, I hope you didn't get indigestion from eating so quickly and you're um, welcome back. So I'm going to convene uh, the next session of the uh, workshop uh, on regulatory strategies to address prescription opioid related harms uh, hosted by the Committee on Pain Management and Regulatory Strategies to Address Prescription Opioid Abuse and Harm um, uh, of the National Academies. Um, the next session will be a, a single presentation by uh, Nath uh, Dr. Nathaniel Katz um, on accelerating the development of better treatments for pain, notes from the drug development battlefield. Dr. Katz is president of Analgesic Solutions, a research and consulting firm focused on analgesics. He's also adjunct assistant professor of anesthesia at Tufts University School of Medicine. His interests include clinical research methods, analgesic clinical trials, opioids for chronic pain, opioids and addiction, neuropathic pain, and cancer pain. He has completed numerous clinical trials of treatments for pain involving pharmaceuticals, non-pharmaceutical analgesics and devices, and has also conducted studies relating to opioids, pain, addiction, and other issues related to opioid therapy. So we're pleased to have him uh, with us. And uh, Dr. Katz, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much, and, and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to be here with this august uh, group. Uh, I am going to take a different perspective than the other speakers. I'm not going to be speaking a lot about the opioid epidemic and, and what's going on out there, although I certainly have a lot of thoughts about that and, and uh, have been working uh, square in the middle of that problem for about uh, 20 years now. Uh, my uh, premise for my presentation will be a little bit different, which will be uh, we're not going to work our way out of this problem as long as we don't have any better treatments for pain than the opioids. And so what are we doing to develop better treatments for pain, and how can we do that to better? That's, that's the angle that I'm going to take. I, I know that the focus of today's meeting is primarily about what the FDA can do, uh, and I will focus primarily on that, although I have some additional thoughts to add uh, as well. Let's see. How do I do? Oh, there we go. Uh, I think it's, it's useful for people to... Um, uh, understand the perspective of the speakers that are speaking today. So uh, very briefly, my, my background is as a clinician. I took care of sick people with uh, acute and chronic and cancer pain for many years in uh, a couple of Boston area hospitals, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and also uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where I, I ran the uh, chronic pain program there. Um, I, uh, through the grace of uh, Bob Rappaport, uh, Sharon Hertz's predecessor, I uh, ended up chairing the advisory committee to the uh, to this uh, division of the FDA for an, a number of years, and so I got a, a taste of uh, the struggles that the folks at the FDA have and what what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis to uh, get their job done. Um, and since then, I started a, uh, a company, and the, the mission of my company, Analgesic Solutions, is to accelerate the development of better treatments for pain. That's what my professional mission has focused on for the past uh, 10 years or so, and, and that's what I'll be uh, speaking about. So I do have um, a uh, diversity of perspectives, I think, and, and I think I, I tend to take a, a, a broad perspective on, on these issues. Uh, I've focused a lot of my career on studying the benefits of opioid analgesics, which, uh, and I, uh, which there are many clinical trials showing the benefits of opioids for chronic pain. I assume the committee is aware of those studies, and if you're not, I'll be happy to send them to you, as well as numerous meta-analyses that have been done uh, about those studies. That's not really a controversial uh, issue, I don't think, if you read the literature. I've also done uh, just as much work on, on, to, on showing the world about the harms of opioids. I've published many studies on opioid risks. I started a whole academic program at Tufts just focused on risks of opioids, so I'm, I'm very interested in both sides of that uh, equation, but won't be speaking about that uh, today. Uh, so what, what has the FDA done to accelerate the development of better treatments for pain? The folks at the FDA know that we urgently need better treatments for pain than what we have. That's not a mystery to anybody uh, at the FDA, and there have been <clears throat> there's been a tremendous amount of uh, energy and activity at the FDA devoted to figuring out uh, how to get that job uh, done. Um, in particular, uh, and, and there's been a lot of focus on trying to develop 
uh, safer and better opioid uh, treatments. So when we think about better treatments for pain, people tend to uh, equate that with non-opioid treatments. And in a sense, that's right. We do need, we do need non-opioid treatments for pain. But if somebody could develop a safer opioid, that would not be a bad thing uh, either. And so there has been a lot of effort. Uh, you, you heard some presentations earlier today about all the activity <clears throat> that's been going on uh, to accomplish that goal. And I'd like to emphasize just a couple of things the FDA, the FDA has done that I think have been particularly useful. Um, first of all, there's this initiative, which was called the Impact Initiative and now is called the Action Initiative. And that's a public-private partnership that allows the FDA to meet with key stakeholders and work together uh, to figure out how to better do clinical trials of treatments for pain so we can accelerate um, that whole process and get more reliable information out of our clinical trials. Clinical trials are hard, uh, they're complicated, they're confusing, they're difficult to execute. You don't just snap your fingers and then a clinical trial uh, appears and tells you crystal clear uh, information. There are a lot of methodological challenges involved with doing those studies, and this initiative has uh, done a lot of work to um, to help uh, improve uh, the way we uh, do studies. There have been a bunch of guidance documents that have come out that have been very useful to the pharmaceutical industry in helping them focus their attention uh, in, a, in a clear and effective direction. And I also uh, want to say, and nobody asked me to say this, that <clears throat> I know a bunch of the people in this division personally have since uh, probably the year 2000. I've grown up to some extent with them, and they're very hardworking. They could all make more money working elsewhere. Uh, they've got more work to do than they've got time in the day to do it, and I, I think it's appropriate to uh, uh, acknowledge that. So um, my own history with this problem is that back in the mid-1990s, uh, when I was a pain management physician at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, I thought that I was going to con conquer the world of pain by just becoming a great uh, pain management physician and uh, learn all the skills. And we learned about acupuncture and chiropractic and the medications and injections and surgeries. And we were going to make it all available to our patients and, and do better than others uh, had before. And it took me about five or six years to realize that that wasn't going to work uh, for me as a strategy because no matter how well uh, you utilize the available tools, the available tools just aren't that good. They have limited efficacy and they have all sorts of safety problems that we've heard about to a great extent already today. So I went through sort of a soul searching process to try to figure out uh, why don't we actually have better treatments for pain? If, if you're going to take an interest in, in, in developing better treatments for pain, a good place to start might be to figure out why it hasn't been done already. It's not, there's not been no shortage of effort to uh, develop better treatments for pain, so why hasn't it uh, worked? And, and when I say it hasn't worked, um, let me be clear what I mean by that. We ha don't have a single example of a treatment for pain that's been rationally developed the normal way through animal models and preclinical testing and human clinical trials, that beautiful cartoon <clears throat> that we saw earlier. We don't actually have a single success uh, that way in modern drug development. Virtually all the treatments we have are either derived from plants that were used thousands of years ago, the opioids and on steroidals, or were developed actually for other sorts of problems, epilepsy, uh, uh, depression, and then were found accidentally to be effective for pain. So, so we haven't been successful in developing better treatments for pain. Why? And it seemed, um, talking to a lot of people about that, that there are really two sorts of uh, problems. One is that the preclinical studies that we do, the animal efficacy studies that we do, don't predict human efficacy very well. That's a huge problem, because that's what drug development is. And then the second piece of the problem was that um, there have been all sorts of problems with the clinical trials that we do. You have many cases of drugs that you know work, how do you know? We can talk about that. You know the drug works, but yet the trial fails to show it. And that um, is a major problem in uh, how are you going to develop the drugs when you can't do reliable uh, clinical trials. So that's a big problem. And I decided that from where I was sitting, I would focus on this problem. And so I went threw myself headlong into the task of trying to figure out how to do uh, better clinical trials. And I ignored this preclinical problem because I figured, well, I'm not a basic scientist. That's kind of none of my business. I'll take what the basic scientists to give me, and I'll just give it to patients uh, in the clinic. And that's going to be my uh, way of attempting to contribute to this space. So I did that. I did that for about 20 years, and now it's 2016. I started doing clinical trials in the mid-1990s, and this is a very partial list of some of the classes of analgesics that I've given to human beings myself with my own hands over the last uh, 20 years. 
you see any of those drugs in the market, none of those drugs are on the market. Uh, some of them have demonstrated efficacy, have had safety problems, none of those drugs are on the market. So um, I went through another soul searching process in the last a few years and asked myself, gee, I'm doing everything I can to clean up how we do clinical trials. I'm studying these new treatments as fast as they come out of the laboratory. Still, I'm not really much better off than I was 20 years ago. Why? And I started to ask myself, um, I started to become aware of this literature on the reproducibility crisis that I would imagine most of you are aware of, where all sorts of uh, studies uh, that are published in reputable journals eventually get retracted because of all sorts of reasons. Sloppiness, fraud, and this debate about you know what, how much of each one of these problems contributes to the overall problem. But the bottom line is that um, there are a, there's a crisis of reproducibility in our uh, modern uh, science, including and particularly drug development science. There are several uh, reviews that have been done on this issue, one by Amgen and one by Bayer that I'm aware of, and the percentage of uh, published uh, studies, published landmark studies that Amgen was able to re reproduce in its own labs was 11%, and that Bayer was able to reproduce in its own labs was 25%. So you would conclude from this that actually the majority of preclinical basic science studies, there's something wrong with them. And meanwhile, I'm taking these drugs and I'm giving them to human beings, and not all of them are doing well. That's a problem. So how much does this apply to pain research in particular? Nobody actually knows because it's not been looked at to my knowledge, but it's enough of a concern that that action group that I mentioned earlier has actually come out with new recommendations for how to address this issue of non-reproducibility, at least in pain studies. This is 2016. Are these going to be adopted? How will we know? You know, I have no idea, but it's, it's certainly a problem. So, gee, that was a concern to me. Am I giving my patients drugs that actually don't even work uh, in, in preclinically because the experiments, is that, maybe that's actually a big reason why we don't have uh, better treatments for pain. I don't know. Let me start asking for preclinical efficacy data and see what happens as I uh, go through my life um, doing these clinical trials on people instead of just taking the word for it, people's word for it that this drug actually did show efficacy in preclinical experiments. I've been doing this for about three years now. This is a purely anecdotal. This is what Nat's been up to for the last few years, so you can take that for what it's worth. And here's what I've been finding. Gee, the study was never really done. It was just a PowerPoint slide. They, oh, sorry, we can't find the study report. Uh, there, there, here's the study report, and it's a Xerox page from somebody's handwritten uh, laboratory notebook. Um, when you ask about quality control in the labs, you can't find quality control standards. And by the way, that's true both in academia and in industry, surprisingly. I'm a little surprised about the industry. Selective reporting of data. We studied 100 rats, and here's the, how the results looked in 15 of them that I wanted, that I chose to report. We can't find the rats. You know, we ordered 200 rats from the animal lab, and here's a published study on 40 of them. What happened to the other 60 of them? There's no accountability uh, for that in the way research is done uh, in, our, in our era. There's a shocking ignorance of basic pr principles of experimentation in many of these studies. Professors telling their grad students, you, we don't have to you know, blind our experiments because the rats you know, don't know what they're getting, like things like that, that like in your first undergraduate class in research, you would know, you know it wasn't the case. Uh, and then frank uh, fabrication. You know, there have been cases where I know people who worked in that lab, and I talked to them, and they said, "Oh yeah, I know that grad student. I know he wrote that it was randomized. That study is not. That guy never randomizes his his experiments. Things like that." So I'm very concerned about this, and um, therefore I've got ten recommendations that I'm going to present in the next couple of minutes, and uh, I'm only going to actually talk about five of them, and the rest of the five are in my slides, and I invite you guys on the committee to cogitate about those and give me a call if you want to discuss them any further. But my first recommendation, which may surprise you since I'm actually a clinician and a clinical trialist, is I believe the FDA should start reviewing preclinical efficacy data. I'm not really that interested in the FDA's interpretation of those results. Gee, it was positive in the Chung model, therefore it should be done in post repetic neuralgia. That's kind of not really the FDA's uh, business. But was the study actually done? Is there a report? Was there frank data fabrication and fraud? Uh, was one endpoint reported, but the other 10 endpoints were not reported? Just that basic level of scientific integrity for efficacy studies. If the FDA doesn't do that, nobody's going to do that. 
You'd think that sponsors would be smarter about this because they're paying gobs of money to in-license these products, but some, some of them are, most of them are not, and there's a whole sociology and business issue behind that, why that is that we could talk about. So I think the FDA should review preclinical efficacy data and maybe start with an audit. Is this a problem or isn't this a problem? Maybe commission an independent study to take a bunch of drugs that are, were submitted, INDs submitted for pain, and just see if you can find the preclinical efficacy reports and is there basic scientific integrity there or not. That's my recommendation, number one. And if it turns out that there's no problem, great. Let, we'll, we'll continue doing business as usual. I'll look elsewhere for something to do. Uh, and if it is a problem, then it may, be, it may make sense for the FDA to start doing this on a routine uh, basis. Doing this will require a major retooling of how things are done at FDA and will require a substantial infusion of money into the FDA to do that. But otherwise, we're going to keep getting the results we've been getting. Uh, next topic. So I want to talk to you about a class of analgesics called the anti-NGF antibodies. Now, um, when I originally made this slide, I was going to put a blank there, and I was going to say drug X, because I really don't want to get hung up on the specifics of this class. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I won't answer any questions about it. But I think this tail that's been experienced by this class illuminates uh, issues that the FDA struggles with in how it regulates the development of new and potentially game-changing treatments for pain, and it's those issues that I want to talk about, not the drug class itself. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the, this class of drugs, anti-nerve growth factor antibodies. I hear people say all the time, gee, we need a new non-opioid class of medications that's more effective for chronic pain than the opioids. Well, we have one. This class of drugs has already been shown persuasively to be more efficacious for virtually every kind of chronic pain it's been studied in, primarily osteoarthritis and back pain, than the opioids are, and they have, there have been head-to-head -head, uh, studies. So it's a new class. The efficacy, there's no dispute. There have been dozens of high-quality, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trials. Over 15,000 patients have been in the, these studies last I checked. Um, now, this is a, a debatable uh, point, but these, these drugs were put on clinical hold for about four years because of an uncommon and very serious safety concern, which is that some of these patients get a rapid destruction of some of their joints and may end up needing a joint replacement. That's a real problem. I wouldn't want to underestimate the uh, seriousness, seriousness of that. However, the incidence of that side effect is actually lower than the known incidence of opioid overdose in patients with chronic pain being prescribed opioids, which is about 2% a year. The incidence of this was about half a percent a year. With an opioid overdose, you don't always come out so good, whereas with a joint replacement, look, it's a big problem, no question, but actually the patients usually come out better than they were before. So the, the class was put on hold for about four years, and since so in my opinion, this class has already been shown to be safer than the opioids for chronic pain. This is, I believe that this has already been shown. Um, during that four-year period, we had about 80,000 opioid overdose deaths in the United States, right? And so um, we're, this will, and again, I'm not suggesting that if this drug were approved, all these deaths would go away. Don't misunderstand me. What I am saying is that the, when you look at contextual factors, there's a substantial cost for keeping potentially game-changing therapies on hold. Now, again, as I said, my, com my comments are not about this class of therapy. For all I know, this class of therapy may get into the market and end up having some weird toxic toxicity problem, may end up ge getting withdrawn. I have no idea. But what I am talking about is that um, this clinical hold, clinical holds on potentially game-changing pain treatments have major consequences. Another consequence that's been quiet but should be spoken about more, I think, if we want to deal with the world of reality and how, and how drugs get developed, is that J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, uh, which last I checked was the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, and for the last 30 years has had a very vigorous uh, um, portfolio of uh, treatments for pain uh, among several of its operating companies, dropped their anti-NGF antibody, and, in, and because this was their lead, entirely left the uh, drug development space uh, for pain. So J&J &J is no longer developing treatments for pain. So regardless of what you might think about the pharmaceutical industry and money and all that stuff, these are the only people that are going to develop uh, treatments. It's going to come from the pharmaceutical industry. And for the world's largest pharmaceutical company to leave pain, maybe someone ought to pick up the phone and give them a call and, and talk to them about why they did that. Um, and maybe people, someone at the FDA ought to pick up the phone and call them because this is a um, 
quiet but major uh, blow to our my goal of getting better treatments for pain uh, onto the marketplace. So anyway, um, why? So to me, there's a disconnect. Why? I'm, I'm aware of a lot of the proprietary data because I've worked for all these companies as a consultant at one time or another. I'm certainly not aware of everything. Uh, the FDA know more than I do. The FDA is very sensitive to this issue of getting better treatments for pain onto the market. It's not like it's news to them that we need better treatments for pain. So why? So it appears that there's a disconnect. Why? I don't know why. Uh, are the companies hiding safety data that I'm not aware of? Maybe. Uh, is the FDA not considering societal perspective? I believe that they are, but again, it still seems to be a disconnect. Are they looking at the safety data in a, in a biased way or a way that we are sitting on a, on a panel, maybe we look at it differently, being more mindful of, of people dropping like flies out there in the real world from the treatments that we're giving them? I don't know. Um, is there an overemphasis on preclinical toxicology, which, which sometimes happens at the FDA, or people believe sometimes happens at the FDA? I don't know that either. I, I know that the medical reviewers at FDA are very aware of the fact that clinical data trumps preclinical data. I don't know. And that's really my point. My point is that this class of drug got put on hold for four years, and I don't know why, even though I'm a consultant to all these companies. Um, I don't know why. Should people like us know why? Um, so I, I, I have 100% confidence that the FDA has good reasons for doing what it did, and I'm not suggesting that it didn't. What I am suggesting is that those reasons have major societal consequences and should be, I think, open to some kind of um, uh, participation by other uh, groups than the FDA uh, because the stakes are too high. So my recommendation number two, and this is a little radical, is that um, I think if we're going to put promising analgesic classes on hold, um, there should be uh, ex-FDA oversight of that. Now, again, there's proprietary data, there's legal issues, there, it's, this is not a simple, it would not be a simple thing to do, but how else would people in the public um, uh, be assured that um, a broad range of considerations are being uh, taken into account uh, when these very high stakes decisions are made? Um, of course, I'm, I don't doubt that what the FDA people are probably thinking in their minds right now is that, gee, you know, we don't want to create a cure that's worse than the disease. It might be, what, you know, are we now no longer going to be able to put medications on hold that have clear-cut safety and to toxicity problems? You know, so, so this would have to be done in an extremely thoughtful way, but uh, I think the stakes are too high not to um, uh, have more transparency in this uh, process. Another issue, and, and I think the reason why J&J &J probably pulled out of the development of this class of drugs was because the uh, burden of demonstrating safety was very onerous. Now, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a burden of demonstrating safety. There absolutely should be. We don't want to deal with a problem of one class of drugs where we have inadequate data on the risks and benefits by introducing a new class of drugs where we also have inadequate data on the risks and benefits. So don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I believe that the burden, at least in this particular case, of assessing safety with a very large, very expensive, very long-term trials um, tipped, the risk, tipped the return on investment equation for this one particular company so that they're out. Now, again, I'm not saying that we should allow things because they allow the pharmaceutical industry to make money. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is that if we want to see better treatments for pain, we have to keep in mind what the real-world incentives are and figure out ways of developing drugs that address our need for adequate risk and benefit data, and at the same time understand um, the incentive structures of the people who we rely upon to do this work for us. So what I, my recommendation number three is that we think about some way where, you know, right now there's this very sharp divide between phase three and phase four. So you have to develop all this body of information before the drug can get onto the market. And as another speaker pointed out earlier, that's not the end of our study of these drugs. We, ha we, we can't know certain things until larger populations have been exposed, and then we may learn things that say, you know what, time to take it off, time to keep it on. So I think we need some mechanism for limited approval so we can get drugs into a very, almost like a, a place between phase three and the marketplace where there's a very highly restricted distribution, more people can be exposed, we can get data in larger and more diverse uh, populations, which several other speakers have called for uh, as well, but that allows the pharmaceutical company to see that things are moving uh, forward. 
Um, so that's my, um, and then only if uh, evidentiary standards were met in that very restricted marketing would then be, would then marketing restrictions be loosened uh, to broader populations. Otherwise, I think we're going to continue to see that as the safety burdens mount, the uh, more and more companies depart from developing better treatments for pain, and we're back where we started, from, and our, our safety, um, and, and, and we're back where we started from uh, with the opioids. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to maybe make one comment about, so the development of abuse deterrent opioids, there, that, that those have been discussed already uh, before. Uh, those are, have already been demonstrated convincingly to be, well, th those drugs for the narrow purpose for which they were designed have demonstrated utility. Less injection, less snorting, that's it. Uh, the other speakers have said that the medications are still addictive, most people still take it by mouth, absolutely true. Um, However, those, drug, those medications do address an important but only part of the uh, overall prescription opioid abuse problem. We do want to incentivize pharmaceutical manufacturers for developing, if, all, if what we have now is morphine and oxycodone, let's at least use it in formulations that are safer and less vulnerable to the sorts of uh, uh, injection drug-related diseases and other uh, phenomena that we've seen from the abuse of those uh, products. Uh, the agency, I think, has gone pretty far in terms of providing some measure of incentives with more clear guidance and things like that that industry needs. But we're stuck with we're stuck in the in the we're stuck not knowing exactly what the evidentiary standard is for pharmaceutical companies to get labeling that this product actually reduces abuse. So far, uh, no company has met that evidentiary standard, and it's not entirely clear what that ev evidentiary standard is. Is epidemiology ever going to be enough? Uh, are epidemiologic methods ever going to be persuasive enough that no matter how many epidemiology studies that you have, the methods are still limited enough that uh, they won't ever make it over the finish line? Do we need large randomized control trials, as was done, for example, by Edgar Adams? And I think, Ted, you were involved in this study, too, in the mid-'90s, that 11,000 patient uh, uh, trial on the, uh, that looked at the rate of abuse of um, tramadol versus uh, hydrocodone versus non anti-inflammatory drugs. Is that what we need, some large prospective trial? We need to know. Uh, and I think that clarity will uh, accelerate the more interest in um, this class. Uh, I have a comment. I know that one of the focuses of this committee is how can we better take into account um, uh, public health context, and I, I just want to simply say that there are uh, available models for estimating the public health impact of introducing a new treatment for pain to the market, um, and I actually have that model here on a spreadsheet that I could show you live, but I'm out of time, so you're going to have to uh, give me a call, and I'll show it to you offline if you want. But the, taking to it, but doing the, that kind of modeling is well, well known. These kind of things are widely done, um, and so um, uh, I would encourage the committee to consider uh, these sorts of models. and and looking at the, uh, trying to figure out what the impact would be of in individual drug approval decisions on the public health. Um, I'm only going to make two more comments and then I'll stop uh, out of time. I'm not sure how many of you know, but um, in response to the first prescription opioid abuse epidemic, which took place after the Civil War and in, into the 1910s, the government took actually a very aggressive stance and, and in 1929 launched a program, this is pre-NIH now, launched a program, a uh, medicines development program that ran for almost 100 years actually, and most of what we know about opioid pharmacology came out of that program. Naloxone came out of that program, naltrexone came out of that program program, buprenorphine came out of that program, the agonist antagonist came out of that program. A lot of the medications that were, have been spoken about at length today came out of that program. That program was shut down in 2008 by the NIH for, quote, in the email that I got, lack of interest. 2008, middle of the prescription opioid epidemic, the NIH Medicines Development Program shut down. So I think that as another recommendation, the NIH needs to revive that program. We need a more massive approach to this problem than tinkering around the edges with a funding a study here and a study there. I can provide anyone who's interested in much more information about that program. And finally, um, 
As I mentioned already, there are plenty of randomized placebo-controlled trials showing that opioids are efficacious for chronic pain. That's not a debatable point. What is clear, though, is that the methods of those studies are limited in very important ways, duration of follow-up, measuring the things that we care about. Um, and so people have been, it's not that, pe that this problem was just discovered today in this meeting. People have been trying to get that study funded for 20 years. I submitted a grant application to the NIH in 1998 to do that study. Others have, too. The problem is that the NIH has never been interested in funding that. Time for them to fund it. I'll stop now. Thanks for your attention.